Hello, friends. So on this week's episode of The Rogue Historian, I speak with novelist and screenwriter Don Alexander, who has written this book, Shackles of a Freeman, the untold story of Lewis Sheridan Leary. Now, this is a really great piece of historical fiction that covers the life and times of a real-life historical actor who is the son of a free black man in North Carolina who grapples with and with his own identity and struggles uh, with his life as a free black man in the antebellum South. And he finds his way into the ranks of John Brown's crew and the raid of Harper's Ferry. So it's a really, really gripping, compelling story. Uh, I reviewed this book on my website some time ago, so please uh, follow the link down below uh, and check that out. Get a copy of the book for yourself, read it, enjoy it, and uh, have a listen to what Don has to say. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. All right. All right. Ah, there we are. All right, Don. Mm, thanks for being on the show, man. I, I, you know what? I've wanted to have you on now for a while. I, um, I read your book last year. Um, and since I've, you know, start, re-kicked up the podcast, uh, you know, you were the first person on my list uh, to call up for this. So welcome to the show, man. I appreciate it, Dr. Harris. Uh, really, really appreciate this. This is an honor. And call, and call me Keith. Come on, man. Okay, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I, I, I appreciate the professional courtesy. I do. Uh, but hey, you know, we're friends. So let's, um, let's uh, you know, we, we can. Uh, we per can perfect. Yeah. You know, I was, you know, my dad was an army guy. So. I've always totally. sir and know. doctor and all that. So I'm going to call you Keith. <laughs> Man, I, you know, so I, I was brought up and there's a lot of a military men in my family too. And that was always kind of the, always kind of the thing, yeah. you know, at first. And then, and then we get, we get, we get past it. So <laughs> anyway, so look, I've got your book here. Uh, this is, um, uh, the book is called Shackles of a Freeman. Um, the untold story of Lewis Sheridan Leary. And um, I very much enjoyed this book. Um, I want to talk about this in a sec, but before we do, I, you know, your background is actually pretty interesting. You didn't set off in your professional or your educational world really to be a novelist. Uh, and, no. and, and, and I might add that this is a, a novel, a historical fiction based yes. on real people, but written, you know, uh, in a, fiction, a, a fictional take on, on real historical actors. Uh, but you didn't start off in your life to become a novelist. So, so tell us a little bit about your background um, and, uh, and, and we can go from there. Okay. Well, uh, wow. Hey, how much time do we have? <laughs> we have all kinds uh, of time. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I was born March 17th, uh, which so happens to be Lewis Leary's birthday mm -hmm. in the book. I was born March 17th, 1985 in Fort Huachuca, Arizona. My dad at the time was a second lieutenant. And my mom, uh, she, she, was a, um, she was working on base, but her dad um, was... Uh, Puerto, he's Puerto Rican, and he joined the U.S. Army and served in Vietnam. So she was a military brat growing up. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I uh, I was born in Fort Huck, Arizona. And shortly after I was born, six months later, I think we my first time flying uh, at six months old to a place called Freebird uh, in Germany. It was a base. My dad got assigned. And then uh, from there, uh, I moved. we moved back to the States, and I lived in Arizona for another year. And we didn't end up moving back to Germany until 1990. So I spent most of my childhood on army bases in Germany. And uh, and I can tell you, you know, being a black American, mixed Puerto Rican, living in Germany, um, I think that's where I built my love of history mm -hmm. because I under had to understand the context of where I was. Mm -hmm. You know, I was, you know, in school, they had to teach you, hey. We said our pledge is a pledge of allegiance every day. Um, and they said, hey, this is the reason why you're here. Um, and then we learned about World War II. Mm -hmm. And I just remember at the time, we it was a place uh, called Würzburg. And I remember my mom saying, oh, this place was bombed. They, you know, the, you know, I saw pictures and this place was bombed. And I was scared because I thought it was recently. <laughs> and it was like, no, no, it was back in... 1944. So my brain at four years old had to kind of go. Oh. So that was a long time ago. And we're here. And then I remember in 1990 when the Gulf War happened. And that's where I completely understood what my dad's job was, where he had to kind of kneel down and say, hey, son, you know, I'm in the army. This is what I do. And this is what war is. And this is what could happen to me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, 
you know, at five years old, given that context, that's when I really understood, wow, there's a lot of things that go into this thing, this experience we call life. So I learned that really at a young age. And that's what built on my interest of history and just um, just understanding what my place in the world was. Mm -hmm. And so I went to six different middle schools in between, you know, California, Wisconsin, Germany. Uh, but I ended up uh, moving, uh, uh, moving in with my dad uh, uh, when my parents got divorced when I was five. And I uh, ended up moving with my dad when I was uh, 14, middle, the middle of eighth grade to a place called Heidelberg, Germany. And that's where I graduated. And mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, there's a there's a ton of stuff. I, I was a wrestler. I wrestled in college um, mm -hmm. and I uh, got my degree in uh, 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 mass communications with the focus on public relations. Uh, and I minored in sociology. And then mm -hmm. I moved back to Germany and worked as a uh, marketing specialist as a civilian. Um, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, so that's, yeah. That's, that's a really interesting background. You travel the world at a very young age. You see lots of different perspectives, right? Oh, for sure. So, for so sure. you get a more of a global or at least European perspective um, on, on the human experience uh, in addition to the American perspective. And that. so you probably had something of a different take on things. You, you know? had to understand. You had to understand when you walked off the base and we always lived outside of base that, mm -hmm. you know, you had to represent who you were to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm. So, you know, my identity was built from there. I'm an, I'm an American and then also I'm black American and my dad represents this. And that's what really gathered my interest in black, mil uh, uh, black American military history. Mm -hmm. uh, because when understanding the history of the black American, um, man, you know, for those who have served uh, for this country, mm -hmm. that wasn't a lot of times fair, takes a lot. There's a different degree of dignity and pride that goes in to someone mm -hmm. who has fought in this for this country and, uh, and you know, at, at times wasn't given a fair shake. So mm -hmm. I was drawn into that because I wanted to understand why my dad joined and, you know, I was raised and he held his head up high and and marched and marched forward. And uh, he always he always remind, reminded me who I was, you know, um, in the context, you know, you're you're you know, black American. This is your history. And you're also American. And when you're out here, when you're outside of this country, you represent your people to the best of your ability. And we knew about our history. And he goes, you know, you have no other choice but to do right by them because people had to suffer and this goes with everybody that's that's here on earth a lot of people had to suffer for us to be alive today once i was given that context as a kid it got it was easier to grasp you know mm -hmm. i look back and i go okay well if my family had to go through this or if my ancestors had to go through this then i have to do right by them and move and 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 and, and um and honor them by uh you know, understanding what they went through and then just going forward and and uh, and doing right. Um, so that's why writing the book meant so much to me as well, because there's so, so many so, people involved in that. And so you you decided now to 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 go all in on this. And now you are a novelist uh, you know, with this background. And now you're a novelist and you have an interest. Well, we talked before I started recording. We were talking about what you're working on uh, in World War Two history, which we'll get to in a minute. But this is. You know, antebellum history. This is right, the, the story that you tell is right on the eve of the Civil War, and I don't want to give away too much yet. We'll get to it, but it's right on the <laughs> eve of the Civil War. Um, you talk about a black family in the Carolinas that is, in many ways, exceptional, um, and and, uh, and 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 in many ways complicates. I think the, the sort of standard story we hear, standard narrative we hear about slavery in the United States. Um, and I'm curious as to how you got yourself into into the 19th century. What drew you to that? Now, in my own, and I always ask everybody this. And a lot of times, it's it's often the same story. It's like you know, my my parents were into it, and they told they would tell me stories of our ancestors, and and that was my case. Like I used to hang out with my grandparents a lot, and they would tell me about you know our ancestors in the Civil War, and our ancestors did this and this and the other thing, and it got it piqued my interest as a little kid, and then I looked more into it. Uh, and I found out that the story was way more complicated than the story they told me. 
uh, yeah. when I was little, you know, and, and, and that's what, that's what, uh, really compelled me to become a professional historian and a history teacher, uh, is that just to sort of unpack, uh, unpack the stuff that we never really hear about. And I'm wondering if you had a similar kind of experience that drew you to this particular story. One thing that I remember some of my earliest memories when I started to form words, a lot of times I asked why, mm-hmm. right? Why, why is the sky blue? Why is this? Why? Is yeah, that? yeah, totally. And, you know, I, I, I thank my parents for this because they always tried their best to answer no matter how trivial the question was. Mm-hmm. So I was very observant. And mind you, being uh, born in Fort Huachuca and also living there when my memory started to form, uh, we had a lot of uh, Buffalo Soldier paintings. We had a lot of Native American paintings because mm-hmm. Fort Huachuca was an old Buffalo Soldier base. And of course, there was a lot of Native American population there. There was, um, so my, so I was already observant to that. What is that? Who are they? You know, um, while you know the these soldiers in the painting, they look cool. Um, and it's funny because you know, when I started to love football, my favorite team. You know, it's it's tough to say now, but in context, my my favorite team was the Washington Redskins Mm -hmm. because I felt that I identified with that insignia on that helmet. That's how Mm -hmm. I viewed the world. You know, he, he, he had brown skin and he looked dignified. And that was my favorite team when I was five years old. And then um, understanding uh, the Buffalo soldier side of it, where, you know, you have these, you know, black men in blue uniform and all that. So that's what got my interest into the 1800s, uh, the 19th century. Um, and then, of course, moving to Germany. And then you learn about World War Two, and, and then you're, you know, going to Rome and, and seeing it, going to 16th Chapel and mm-hmm. you're just going everywhere. Um, you realize how small <laughs> you are. Uh, <laughs> but there's so much. I always try to tell people. If you can think back, if you can go back 200 years, think about how many people have to be alive during that time for you to be alive today. It's, you know, so many. And then, you know, go to ancient Egypt. There's, you know, countless thousands of ancestors that had to do the right things for us to be alive today. So I was like the cause and effect of of history. So that's what piqued my interest is, um, just trying to understand who I was first. And I will tell you, the most consistent thing as I was moving around and trying to understand this crazy military brat life, we, we call it, the military kids call each other military mm-hmm. brats because uh, most of us move every three to five years. Um, but the only thing that was consistent to me were uh, movies and music. Mm-hmm. And I also loved music that told stories. So I was a storyteller since I was a kid. I loved, uh, I, I was very empathetic to lyrics and songs and also movies. My favorite movie is Glory. Um, I watched that when I was five years old. <laughs> I, you know, um, it's funny. I just, showed my- that, I just showed that film to my Civil War students just the other day, as a matter of fact, and they loved oh. it. And you know what? I'll tell you something about that movie. Um, it's, it's, the movie was made in the, is it the late 80s, I think? Right? 1989. Okay, and it holds mm-hmm. up. It oh, yeah. holds up pretty well. You know, that's a, that movie's coming up. I'm 40 years old now, and it's 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 doing okay. I showed it. I hadn't seen it in a minute uh, myself. I've seen it a zillion times. You know, I'm a Civil War guy, but right. I hadn't seen it in a minute. And then I showed it to the kids, and they were, I mean, they were captivated by the film. The acting is good. Um, oh. You know, all the characters are good. There's some there's some complexity to their you know, and and you know, uh, and and they do a nice job, I think, of telling the story of of the 54th. Massachusetts. And then if you really zoom out a little bit, telling the story of the USCT, the United States Colored Troops, and oh, yeah. the things that black soldiers had to deal with in the Civil War, like discrimination, pay discrimination, fatigue duty when they want to come back, getting, you know, dismissed as incompetent, all that kind of stuff that they had to deal with. So they tell Also, I, I mean, it. what's really big, and that's what really got, so that movie really piqued my interest. And I wanted to go beyond that and really know the whole story. And, uh, you know, it, 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 you know, the, the, they, 
to be the first to attack a fort, they knew the mission was tough, mm-hmm. and they did it. Um, yeah. And that's what the, mo- the the movies about. You know, hey, you know, we're gonna we're gonna fight for our freedom, and we're gonna do it. Uh, but that's such a complex part of history. Um, sending them out there first, it was it's a tough movie. I uh, I watched it again uh, last month. I always make it an effort to watch it once, uh, one time, uh, once a year. I know, I know the movie by heart. And Robert Gould Shaw, he deserves a real big place in history to be a young mm-hmm. guy and stand up for 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 that. Um, he's almost like John Brown in his own right. Yeah, in a way. Yeah, I mean, he he. De- I mean, he's a he's a he's a he's a complicated figure. I mean, I've read his letters. Um, I was I was going to say that his. Yes. You know, he, he, he has some, some interesting opinions and, and, but, but, you know, he, he does stand by, uh, his men leads them into battle, gives his life, uh, you know, fighting alongside of his men. So, I mean, he definitely, uh, definitely deserves the accolades, the praise that he gets, uh, today. And yeah. so, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, and I thought that, um, Matthew Broderick did a pretty decent, he looks kind of like him too. Uh, yeah. You know? Oh, for sure. For sure. <laughs> So I thought sure. you did a pretty decent, pretty decent job in that film. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good story. And the, in the family itself, the, the gold, uh, the Shaw family. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, when that attack happened, um, they had um, displayed Robert Gulshaw's body in the fort for a little bit. And mm-hmm. then once it started to decay, they threw him back in the grave with all his troops. And mm-hmm. um, before Fort Sumner went underwater. The family had acquired, hey, you know, we're not looking to 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 bury him up, and we just want to know where he is. Mm-hmm. And they said, you know, we buried him with, you know, his n words, and you know, the family mm-hmm. was like, okay, good, all right, as long as he's buried with his men. So yeah, that, that was- that's you know that uh, interesting. They just recently actually found his uh, his uh, um, his sword. Actually, I heard about that. Yeah, I heard mm-hmm. about that. And they they I think it's in Boston in the museum but they they found it uh i know so. that's very cool yeah yeah so but that's what piqued my my interest knowing mm-hmm. that this story was true i i i it was one of the movies i rewatched all the time mm-hmm. since i was five and uh yeah, and then tombstone's my second favorite so. <laughs> that's also a good movie by the way that's yeah I, so i was and i didn't know i didn't know this that it was the same director that did oh movie. was it really so oh, yeah. i and and it was, you know, ever since I was a kid, I found that out maybe about 10 years ago. I was like, oh, wow, that's funny. <laughs> so, yeah. So let's talk about, um, let's talk about Lewis, uh, Lewis Sheridan Leary a little bit. Now you have a person, like you, you feel a personal connection. When I'm reading this novel and I read your background, you, I can totally tell that you feel a personal connection to this individual. Can you explain that? But first explain who is this guy? <laughs> um, what's his family? And, and, what, and tell me a little bit about your personal connection with him. Because I found that to be fascinating. Oh yeah, so I mean, Louis Leary, um, he's one of the um, he's one of the Black Americans that died during the John Brown raid. Uh, he, right. uh, you know, I, I will tell you, this it still gives me chills when I think about it. So I'm a screenwriter by trade, and one of my screen uh, one of my screenplays is called Bare Knuckle Buffalo. It's about two Buffalo soldiers. Uh, to try to fight their way out of the army. So I was doing uh, some research because one of the characters had his, you know, I was going to have his brother uh, uh, fight in Harper's Ferry. So mm-hmm. I like to do re- a lot of research. You know, I'm, I'm one of those types that if I put my characters in a place in history, I try my best to make it as authentic as I can. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so in doing that research, you know, I looked it up and I saw that picture of Louis Leary, the, the one that's on the second page. And it hit me. I was about 26 at the time. And uh, yes, that, one. that picture right there. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, my mom was walking by. I was like, hey, mom, look at this picture. So like, oh, wow, kind of kind of looks like you. Like, yeah. It actually kind of does a little bit. I see it. <laughs> and, and mind mm-hmm. you, at that time I was 26. And that picture, he, he was 24 when he took that mm-hmm. picture. So. I had some hair. <laughs> so, um, so my mom was like, oh, yeah, it kind of looks like you. I was like, yeah, you know, he's, and, I, and I was like, wow, he's 24 when he died. Man, I can, can only imagine. Right. And so I did my research and I and that was 2012. Mm-hmm. So I remember, you know, sitting, sitting down and and I always told myself I was going to write a book when I turned 35 and it was coming to 2020. And 
I remember watching this documentary. Somebody walked by the camera and kind of looked like me. And I was like, oh, man, that's weird. You know, that's, that only happened once to this other guy. So I started doing some research. And that's when I dropped my phone. And I was looking it up on my phone. And I dropped it because that's when I saw his birthday. You know, Louis Leary was born March 17th, 1835, exactly 150 years before I was born. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when it that's when it hit me, and that's when I really took a deep dive on who he was and um, how complicated he was. A mixed guy in a mixed up world, and mm -hmm. I felt a personal connection because I've always felt that trying to understand my place in history uh, mm -hmm. and my place in you know this world, you know. Um, so, just knowing that, also knowing that he was, and and it opened my eyes to you know. I think in history, and, and as you know, a lot of people will say, oh, you know, this is the way it was. And we forget that America is very unique because each state has their own different laws. And sometimes mm -hmm. even back then, it was like stepping into another country. It's like going from Germany to France, going to North Carolina to Florida, you know, was different. Or even going to imagine going from Boston and traveling to the south in the mm -hmm. uh, mid 1800s. Uh, so we forget that. And so it really opened my eyes up because I'm like, OK, you know, wow, he's his dad was a harness and saddle maker. OK, let me look up his history. Oh, wow. He's considered a mulatto because he's he's mixed up with, you know, you have uh, Native American, black, Irish. Um, mm -hmm. You know, his dad fought in, in uh, uh, Louis Leary's grandfather fought in the Revolutionary War. So you have all these characters with some type of rich history in the confines of American history. And this is North Carolina. So I'm going, OK, well, so his family is free and they're wealthy. Hmm. So what gets what makes a black man who's free in North Carolina want to fight against slavery? Oh, this is interesting. Mm -hmm. Because I did. Yeah. Go on, go on, go on. Because now you have now if I'm putting myself in there in, in Lewis Leary's shoes and I go, well, my dad is a black American man considered mulatto by the census. And my mom is, is black and my family, my brothers and sisters, and we own this property and we own this house. I'm living a privileged life. Mm -hmm. Then this is a system. So what makes me so special? Why do I see other people working in bondage and I'm kind of, you know, I'm living, you know, I'm learning my trade and my dad's telling me that I'm going to be successful in that. So mm -hmm. that's what drew my interest with Lewis Lear altogether, because I knew the ending. And now I had to find the middle. What gets mm -hmm. him what gets a, a black American who is in 1950s decides to move to Ohio to fight against the institution of slavery. Mm. I think a lot of times we hear stories about the the slave who has run away from their bondage, who has mm -hmm. uh, uh, suffered countless, countless, uh, you know, trauma, uh, countless, you know, violence. They run away and normally you hear the story about them going back for revenge or, you know, you hear that personal um that personal abuse. And so mm -hmm. to a reader or to an audience member, that's easy. Okay. I understand why he would fight against it because he lived it. Louis Leary to me was very interesting. And also his, uh, his best friend, uh, John Copeland, they were interesting because they made that choice. Mm -hmm. This, this isn't right. And we're going to fight against it. Such an interesting story. And it, it grabbed me because I find his family to be so exceptional. Uh, a black family living a, uh, a fairly privileged life in North Carolina, even commanding respect in a society where race defines so much. I mean, it, it defines your 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 status really. With an overwhelming majority of black people in the Carolinas in the 1850s, overwhelming majority are enslaved people, uh, and and carry that stigma along with them, I suppose. And here we have a man who his family commands a certain amount of respect. Um, I imagine with, you know, racist assumptions associated with that. I mean, after all, it's just the 1850s, um, you know, but still lives a fairly. You, you, decent, yeah. And, and life, I, look, right? I had to look up the, the population in the census. So there you had uh, you had uh, a decent amount of uh, free blacks 
that mm -hmm. were in the in the in the trades like you had your brick masons uh, sure. you had your harness makers um you had your landowners and all that so but north mm -hmm. carolina you know they wouldn't have been able to do that in south carolina or and then florida uh -huh. so it's always different just like even learning virginia law where a lot of uh free blacks had to be sponsored by their former master to be able mm -hmm. to work and you know so there was all these complicated uh different freemen and slave laws in the south and then also with the fugitive slave act trickled up to the north where in ohio you know uh they didn't have liberty laws where if you were a slave owner and you wanted to go get your slave who was found in ohio you can grab them and take them into a state mm -hmm. of slavery but if you went up to michigan and you tried to get your slave back to they you were going to get arrested and charged uh, uh, it was a thousand dollars, which is a lot of money back then. Oh yeah, Michigan had their liberty laws. Right. Um, so it was just a kind, but that's the boiling point of the states at the time. You know, this was a big moral issue because Europe had done away with slavery, mm -hmm. and actually the Union was feeling pressure from the Crown, and you know they're going through their own stuff in Europe, but saying, hey, if you guys want to be taken seriously you're going to have to deal with your slave situation because the world is we're we're getting rid of that yeah um, by 1850s the last two major uh countries that that held on to the institution were the united states and yep. brazil you know hey, i was going to say because know, portugal uh they were still running illegal and that's what mm -hmm. the amistad the amistad was about mm -hmm. because man in portugal were doing it illegally smuggling yeah. and the british had to actually go there uh, they were um, uh, t uh, they were intercepting those ships and uh, and finding that, and they're trying to tell Portugal you got to got to knock it off. Um, so there was a big so the world was already getting trying to get rid of that that idea, but the states because we were so new, the um, you know we you know the the states were so new, and we were starting to get really divided. Um, and you know as you know, John Brown and Bleeding Candace almost just boiled over to, yeah, this isn't going to end without blood. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> it certainly is. Yeah. You know, so, so you're, so Leary uh, makes the move to Oberlin. He gets involved with uh, abolitionists. He makes the call. Now he's, you know, leaving a privileged life behind and he's turning uh, and, and he's turning against the institution that enslaves uh, his fellow human beings. Um, how do, how does now how can you how do you tap in as a novelist right so now you you take the you take the real life story of this and you take your fish, fictional elements and, and weave that into the story how do you as a no, novelist it, it help us understand how one who is grappling and struggling you know with his circumstances and with all kinds of other how does that person the character development to me is really great in this and he you know he, of course he gets married and he has a kid and, and all this stuff is going on in the background so he's got all of this to deal with right. While this is happening, and yet he makes the call, and he winds up going in with John Brown, uh, uh, and, and his and his very very uh, famous raid on Harper's Ferry. So how do how do you as a novelist get get us get us through this story? Well, I'll tell you the the real history really helped me out, and um, what a lot of people concluded, um, they really couldn't pinpoint why Lewis Leary and John Anthony Copeland joined mm -hmm. John Brown. Uh, they can pinpoint Dangerfield Newby, right? Oh, Dangerfield Newby got a letter from his uh, his wife saying that, oh, we're about to be uh, sold, you know, to the deeper south. So Dangerfield Newby, the other slave that, uh, the, the a fugitive slave that joined John Brown, he had a reason. Um, and, and the history books would tell you his reason. And then uh, also you had Shields Green, who had his reason you know, had lived through the horrors of slavery himself and wanted revenge. But they didn't give me a reason for why Lewis Leary joined. Mm -hmm. And that's helped me out because then I go, OK, well, I have the senses. I know where he lived. I know what his dad did. I know, you know, uh, I know the area of Fayetteville and that history of mm -hmm. how, you know, the Pattersons and, you know, a lot of the free blacks operated in that system. 
Um, but then a lot of blacks from Fayetteville and also Riley moved and migrated to Ohio and uh, particularly Oberlin. So that's what helped me balance it out. And then, as like I said, I've always been an observer growing up and, you know, you know, just being in a place where no, you know, where I can be in France and everybody speaks French and and I'm just watching how people operate and uh, and move. And um, I was able to kind of tap into Louis Leary and go, OK. How does how would I feel, first of all? And, you know, it's one of those things where it would be easier to explain if I said, oh, Louis Leary joined the army and he was sent on this battle, Fort Wagner, and he died. Everybody would understand that, right? Or he, he went to this battle and he died. But every but it the history when I was reading the the um, when I was researching, they always they, they did try to make it well, we don't know why he went, and we don't really understand why he went. And I go, I know why he went. Because there was something that he goes, I am at a point of no return. And I hate this so much. I hate the fact that this country owns slaves and has people in bondage so much that I'm willing to die for. Um, it's almost like football in the early 1900s, right? Where there was countless people dying for a game, right? Mm -hmm. But no matter how dangerous it was, you still had people sign up to play it. Well, this wasn't a game to Lewis Leary. And he mm -hmm. signed up for something. And once that opportunity uh, arise to come to go with John Brown, he was going and he had a lot and he didn't have to do it. He could have stayed put, lived in Oberlin, you know, had a, you know, uh, you know, raise his daughter. But then again, hindsight's 2020, who's to say he wouldn't join the 54th Massachusetts and die in Fort mm -hmm. Wagner, then we wouldn't know his name. Right. And so, so he's succeed. Yeah, this is. It's a good point. I mean, it's a good yeah. point. You're when you when you're when you're looking through this now. You know, one of the things that Glory does well is they take a number of characters and they sort of build a composite cast of different of different uh, experiences. You have a person who was enslaved who escaped to freedom, and, and you've got the the, the older, uh, more more wiser person who's lived a bunch of things. You got the hothead. You know, you've got yep. the you've got the the privileged uh, Boston. You know, yeah, uh, Thomas. From elite black family, right? You've got all these different kinds of people and you can kind of tell their stories and it, and it, and it sort of fits. It fills in for, a, you know, all the stories that you don't hear by yes. taking these particular care. And I wonder if, you know, one thing, one thing that I think uh, a good novelist does is he, it, is that it gets, it gets, it bring, draws the reader in um, and it gets the reader to think about things in different ways. And I think that you do that well. Right. I think that it, I think that, it, you know, when I first read this, I, I wasn't really necessarily thinking about about this, this, uh, this story so much. But then I started thinking about it different. The complications of the black experience in the South, the complications of black experience in the abolitionist movement and what all that meant and what a person, a person's psyche, what how they make that decision when they have so much to lose, which he did. Right. Um, and, and, and when he makes that decision and, and, then he, and then how one goes about doing that, I believe that there are lots, probably a number of stories like that. The guys that joined the USCT, for example, that didn't necessarily have to, yeah. um, uh, probably made some similar, similar decisions. Um, you know, and there's all kinds of reasons for joining the military, you know, but, uh, but the moral conviction had to have been one of them. Yes. Uh, especially when you get people like Frederick Douglass saying, hey, look, you know, you put on the, the blue uniform, you put an eagle on your, I forget, I'm paraphrasing, an eagle on your butt and the bullets in your pocket. I'm sure you've heard the quote. Yeah. Then there's no, there's nobody in the world that can deny you, you know, citizenship for a country that you fought to defend. And of course, you know, the tragedy of the story is, of course, people did de deny them the citizenship once they, you know, at the end of the day. But, but still, that moral conviction, I think, is, uh, is pretty interesting. And I think you tell that story really well. So I appreciate it. If we don't know exactly why he made the call, I think we can we can make we can draw some some assumptions about it, or at least yeah. we can you know we can imagine him making that call, and that's a compelling story. Yeah, Close. you know my my whole point and my whole my mission was to first of all do right by him, mm -hmm. and um and respect and respect the people that he 
that he rubbed elbows with. And also, too, um, there's a lot of things that uh, that I see about John Brown. And what's interesting, if you dive in, like deep dive into John Brown and who he was, a lot of times, I mean, it's kind of a lot of times we take what the South had built up of him. This mm -hmm. guy's a crazy radical and, you know, and that's what was spread across the South. You know, beware of this guy. This guy's a nuisance. And yeah, he was eccentric. And, uh, but the guy had a successful campaign in Kansas. Mm -hmm. This was a, this was a, you know, and you can see I highlight in the book, um, uh, definitely the the shortcomings of that mission. Um, I don't know. Have you seen this movie called RRR? No, I have it's, not. It's a. It's. Have you heard of it? Nope. Okay, I'm unfamiliar with this film, so I got. I got. Okay, I'm going to write it down. So, so it's interesting. So it's it's RRR, and it won an Oscar, I believe, a year ago. It's a. It's an Indian film. Where have I been? No, no. <laughs> but, but, so it's it's interesting because it's a it's an Indian film from you know from india and um it's set in you know apartheid uh, against the british i think shortly i want to say shortly after world war one or before world war one right and it's interesting because one of the characters mission is to infiltrate well he it out is to infiltrate the the army so he can uh get the weapons mm -hmm. to give to his people Right. So when you sit down and you think about it, you go, oh, OK, yeah, it makes sense. Makes sense. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how they you know, it's a it's a it's an insane movie. It's a pretty intense movie. I've never seen a movie like it because it's it's action and it's over the top action. So mm -hmm. but 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 the uh, historical context of it is let me grab the weapons to give to my people so we can fight back against the British. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I and I remember it hit me. I'm going. Yeah, that's what John Brown did, it, you know. So when you package it up the way the movie sold, it's like, yeah, it makes sense. But every a lot of times I'll hear the history uh, told about Harper's Ferry. And, you know, it's sad because either they make it seem like the people that followed him were duped. They make it seem like John Brown was crazier. In, 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 but if you look at his writing and his uh, testimony before he was hung, it's quite it's a man who had deep conviction and I wouldn't call that mm -hmm. crazy. Um, and actually, if we really want to tell the truth, uh, he, what he prophesied came true, right? It yeah, ended in blood, you mm -hmm. know, crazy amount of people had to die, um, to end slavery in America, which was the civil war. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to display John Brown in that light. You know, you can tell he's eccentric, but I didn't want the over the top. Cause I think that was a, propaganda uh uh built during the time to kind of to kind of soften the blow of of harper's ferry oh they he was a crazy guy and let them into a suicide mission well let me um, let me ask you since, since you brought it up the i think it i might be wrong about this but i think it was newsweek magazine about 10 10 or 12 years ago ran uh the cover story it was a story about john brown and uh, the, the the title, the big title on the news cover of the magazine said, "Hero or terrorist?" Right, and it sort of sets up this 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 fairly simplistic binary where you can like you know, and I and I've asked my students, you know, what they, they what they think about this that kind of question: is John Brown a hero or is John Brown a terrorist? Well, on one hand, you go, okay, he fought to free slaves, and never, you know, nobody likes slavery anymore, so that's you know that's heroic, and he died in the, in the process. On the other hand, he seized a federal arm, armory and he, and he meant to gather weapons to go through the countryside, you know, killing people. Um, and so in that, in that regard, you know, he's a, so, but I, I, I tend to think that when we reduce things to very simplistic, he's either this or he's that. Um, I think maybe we missed the point. Um, yeah, well, yeah. You know, so go ahead. I, I'm interested in what you have to think about. No, it's interesting because it. when you say it reminds me of the revolutionary war, um, you know, I love the term, one man's patriots, another man's terrorists. One man's mm -hmm. terrorist is another man's patriot. Mm -hmm. And uh, so when you break that down, it goes, wow, it's all about perspective. 
So I like to think of it like this. And this is like if you look at the Revolutionary War and how you had to build up between the colonials versus the British. But then it was almost like a no civil war because you had people, your next door neighbor could be loyal to the crown. And I'm not going to war. Why would I? I, I like my life here. And then you actually had to. So the British looked at the colonials like, well, these guys are these guys are ter terrorists and they're, you know, they're entitled. Um, the British had so many words for the colonials that we were that they we were ungrateful and all that. Mm -hmm. But uh, they, you know, they had to stir up the pot and cause uh, cause some damage uh, to the British ego and also uh, mm -hmm. created the country we know today in the United States of America. Now, that being said, so if I'm John Brown, if I'm Lewis Leary, uh, you know, uh, if I'm John Anthony Copeland, if I'm just uh, Kagi, if I'm all those guys, if I'm sitting there and I go, okay, the Constitution, if we put race aside and whatnot, if the Constitution is the idea, because we're a melting pot now, and if you look at the Constitution and go, okay, the idea of it, the idea of freedom, what does freedom mean to you, all that good stuff, right? Then the most American thing is to fight for freedom. John Brown knew he was an Amer American. He wasn't, I am, I am not American and I'm going to create my own country. So therefore, I'm going to attack the federal armory so we can get rid of slaves and create our, our own country. John Brown was an American fighting against an evil institution called slavery. And he knew that was mostly the Southern states. And the idea was to create so much of a stir because it, it would have to stop. It would have to go to Washington and Washington would have to have a uh, emergency uh, hearing and go, oh my God, John Brown just got a bunch of weapons. He's going, you know, through the South. He's, uh, his mission wasn't to kill it was, you know, shooting and I'll kill. That's what he did in Kansas. But his mission was to seize, cause much trouble. So emergency meeting, we have to end this now or it's going to end in blood. So he looked at it like it was so in so terrorists or whatnot. His belief system was he was doing the most American thing was fighting for freedom. And I mean, if you look at it, that's what that's how we built our country. And one of the sayings is until we're all free or we're not free you know so yeah that's right i mean that that that, that is true i mean but you know it, so you take a a, a, a slaveholder's perspective on this and you're right to say this is all about perspective um oh, yeah. and, I, and, and there's something i tell my students you know when, when we read this stuff you know i'm not trying to let anybody off the hook for anything but or anything like that or i'm not trying to apologize for anybody but their perspective would suggest that here is a person who's come to liberate you know this is this is um, what would you call it? Servile insurrection is how they probably would have phrased it, you know. And they would have, they would have. And and I looked up the word terrorist. I didn't think the terrorist, the word terrorist, was as old as it was. I thought that would be a 20th century word, and it turns out it's not. <laughs> it turns out it's an old word. They've been using that word for a long time, and this surprised me. It seems like a modern word, but it really wasn't. So I'm pretty sure they would have called him that. But then on the other hand, um, you know, I mean, I, I I see I see your point, and I see where you're coming from. Here, that, that when you think about the idea that the, the words written into the Constitution, like you said, if you take race out of the equation, just read the document, right? And they, and by the way, the Constitution doesn't mention race. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, and if you read the document, and 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 the Constitution pretty clearly says that, you know, uh, freedom. Well, that's what Frederick Douglass law, was right? always arguing about. That's what Frederick mm -hmm. Douglass was saying. If you take the words mm -hmm. and you hold it to, and, and it doesn't mention race in there. So if you Hold on to the words of that idea, then we deserve to have that freedom as well. That you and will. that the Constitution will lean toward freedom, is what exactly. Douglas was saying. By the by, the time you know he had broken ties with uh, uh, with 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 uh, Garrison, and, and Garrison believed that the Constitution was a covenant with. I think he said uh, a covenant with hell and a, something like that. I forget the exact words, but he wasn't big on it because he believed that the Constitution recognized property and man. And Frederick, and Frederick Douglass drifted away from that position. And would come to the conclusion that the Constitution really leans toward freedom if you read, you know, yep. the text, yep. and, and and there you have it. So if we take it as an stuff. idea, mm -hmm. you can insert it to. That's I mean that's what what we've been doing. You know, we're such a melting pot. But mm -hmm. if you have that idea of what this country, remember, people used to say that the streets were paved with gold. 
Back you, know, the, you know, 1900s coming down from Europe, coming, you know, <laughs> Ireland, uh, German immigrants, all that. So this, you know, with that idea. Um, so, you know, but then, of course, perspective is key because, you know, the people of Harper's Ferry definitely would look at John Brown like a terrorist. You got you just came in here. You, you know, killed some people. Uh, I think the mayor was killed. Um, mm -hmm. And then not to and I mentioned it in the book. I mean, think about someone like Hayward Shepard, who, you know, he was he was working as a free man, bought his bought his way towards his freedom, paid his owner for his freedom and worked up the enough money to pay for his wife's freedom, lived in Harpers Ferry as a bellman, as a uh, um, as a railroad worker for the uh, mm -hmm. Baltimore uh, line. And, uh, you know, his and his former owner had uh, sponsored him. So Hayward Shepard, you know, he ends up being the first one killed during the raid, a black man with five mm -hmm. children. Um, you know, those are those are tough pills to swallow. Um, and I wonder how, you know, think about that time. Hayward Shepard's family feels towards, you know, Harper's Ferry. Mm -hmm. um, so. It was it was not perfect at all. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, what happened, um, it was the point of no return for the country. Because if you think about it, you know, 1859 and then we got the Civil War. And we got the Civil yeah, War. I know, man. Yeah, I, I always hesitate to, like, you know, talk about inevitability. That's always a word that troubles me when it comes to history. But I think by 1859, the nation had reached such an impasse that, and, and, when, and when, like you mentioned earlier, when John Brown was being led off to the gallows uh, to meet his maker, as it were, he stated quite clearly that the sins of this nation will not be washed away except with, with blood. And, you know, and he's prophetic in that way, you know, and I, yeah. and I, and I think by 1859, uh, you know, I just know, I don't, I don't see another, I don't see another conclusion to this, um, you know, but again, you know, who knows? Well, yeah. And then, and then I always, cause, and, and I, you said the perfect word is perspective. And I like to look at both sides of the coin um, at the end of the day, when a war is fought, real people fight these wars. You have mm -hmm. one side that believes in something and one side. I always, I, I always talk about it like this, where I think about, let's say, okay, high school, right? Let's say I'm a lion. And your high school, what's your mascot? Uh, it was a royal, or my mascot now is a, is a hawk. Okay. Where right. I teach. So I'm a lion mm -hmm. and you're a mm -hmm. hawk, right? And we're schools from across town. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't like you. <laughs> This is think about society. Think about how well okay. I don't like you, right? Mm -hmm. Because you're a hawk and I'm a lion, and we're gonna beat you in football. We're gonna play this war game, and I'm gonna beat you, and we're gonna rally. We're gonna have pet rallies, and we're because I don't like you. You, you, you're my rival. But now let's expand it a little bit. Our mm -hmm. counties. Well, now we don't like the other county. We're friends though. Me and you are friends because we're from the same county, and mm -hmm. I don't like this. We don't like this other county. Now let's expand it even more. Hey, well, we're state California. We don't like Texas. We're California. Now let's expand it even more. So I, I always use that because, you know, it's an interesting idea for soldiers to be fighting each other, where in any context, they sit down and, and be friends and have a beer. So perspective, from a Southern perspective, they purely believe, they truly believe that they were being invaded. You know, they, you had sieges in Vicks, you know, Vicksburg, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, Fort uh, Sumter, all that. Um, mm -hmm. From their perspective, especially if you were a poor Southerner who's never owned a slave in your life, and now all of a sudden your your uncles and and all and and brothers are getting killed, um, and you believe that this is an invasion. I honestly think after the Civil War and Lincoln being assassinated. Um, I truly think that there wasn't enough effort put in place to 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 mend the better bitterness, because if let's say I went through the Civil War from a southern uh, uh, if I'm from the south and I just been defeated in the war. And you told me the reasoning was it was, you know, to to free the slaves. And I tell you, well, I've never owned a slave. And next thing you know, I had, you know, uh, Union soldiers coming in. And, you know, stealing everything that I own and kicked me out of my house. 
I don't like you and I don't like the situation. And I think it built a generation of bitter. It, it didn't do. I didn't. I don't think it did well with the racism that would propel itself. You know, the Ku Klux Klan and um, the 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 institution of sharecropping um, and, and the terror, the the terroristic ways that were happening during and after the Civil War. So that stuff lingered for, man, almost a cent. I mean, I, I guess people would argue even today it still lingers. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I think there's I think there's some some things that resonate from from unresolved issues. Uh, yeah, so, so I think we sure. have such a dynamic. It really opens my eyes when you think about the 1800s and you go, OK, well, you know, Europe, they were in like, you know, the Napoleonic Wars and, mm -hmm. and Germany, Prussia, all of them. They were fighting each other for centuries. And, oh, yeah. Uh, and, you know, their 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 lineage and rivalry span uh, centuries and. Uh, you know, I, I do have hope for for United States of America. Um, I think if we can start looking at our history and go, wow, you know, we have such a unique history. Mm -hmm. But if we come from it, like if we go, but we want to bring people together and we have like in the history of America, we have. Um, I think once we uh, realize how unique we've been and we are, um, we'll start to really heal. Um, but, you know, who, well, hey, you know. It's, it, it's a nice note to, to end on, I think. And it, and it reminds me a lot of what President Lincoln said in his first inaugural address about the connections that we all share uh, that transcend our differences. And, you know, and, and, and Lincoln was an American exceptionalist to the core and believed in the unique qualities of the United States and believed that, that we did indeed share traditions and history and and common values and all those types of things that that far transcended the sectional differences. And, you know, when he says, you know, we're not enemies, we're friends, you know, we meet you know, that's that's that was really, you know, the point of his first inaugural address when he's offering it. The, his disaffected countrymen a chance to come back now they didn't listen to him uh yeah. but you know uh I, I think that what you said is a, is a nice note to end now you're working on a you're working on a book now right on world war ii yeah yeah it's a historical fiction uh more of like an action adventure it kind of leans more into my screenwriting where shackles of a free man is a first person uh this is going to be a, a third person uh but yeah it's called uh hellfighter son um and it's about a black medic uh, in World War II who has to protect a Jewish child through Nazi-occupied France during mm -hmm. the D-Day invasion. And uh, which interesting reason why it's called Hellfighter's Son is because this black medic, his father was a Harlem Hellfighter during World War I. So the book connects World War I with World War II and uh, a lot of history there. So yeah, that sounds fantastic. And, 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 I, and I look forward to reading that. And uh, this, this, so... This is a, a a novel that is kind of working as a screenplay, working the screenplay. No, no, I mean, no, no. It's more, it's more of a actually where I I would say that uh, Shackles of a Free Man is mm -hmm. a like you know uh, as as far as a uh, historical fiction, there's mm -hmm. more you know it's a first person, so you're mm -hmm. you're having the perspective of Lewis sure. Leary as you're walking through the story, mm -hmm. uh, but with this one is third person, so you're mm -hmm. so it's basically describing what's going on. Okay. As you know, you see the main character go through what he's going through in the world. And beautiful. Uh, yeah, yeah. And I and I like to add to this too as well. Is mm -hmm. I think and I think I alluded to it in the book. You know, history is a very unique thing and a, a lot of times it's not pretty. Um, I would say we all have like we all have mud on our face. We yeah. if we you know as as history is concerned we we all been in the dirt we've all bled we've all cried we all laughed we all, it's it's a shared experience you have people that you know in the early 1900s coming from Italy with pennies in their pocket just to try to live this idea of what an American dream is um, and that came with its own uh, you know blood and sweat and mud so I think the 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 part of healing is acknowledging that. Yeah, we all, we all are muddy. We're all, but guess what? Hey, we're all here. And mm -hmm. uh, and I think when we understand history, I always say cause and effect, the beauty, the beautiful thing about history 
And I know it's cliche to say it is we learn it so we don't repeat it, but somehow we mm -hmm. always repeat it, right? But uh, no, but we learn it so that we can actually understand our place in the world and do right mm -hmm. by those who had come before us. And I think if we get to that point, then we're all happier people. <laughs> so. <laughs> For real. Okay. Well, that's a, that's a great lesson and, and, and a great, and a great spot to end this conversation. So Don, thank you so much for coming on. I've, I've really enjoyed talking to you and finally, you know, getting to talk about this book um, that I've, I've turned my students on to it and that's I great. reviewed it on my website and, you know, gave it high, high praise. And so um, I think everybody should grab a copy, read it, um, learn more about a guy that you, you know, may not have heard of before and, and you should have. So, so uh, thanks again for coming to the show. I really appreciate it. Keith, I appreciate it too, man. It's great talking to you. And we'll get you, you back on. next time. Yes, sir. Yeah, next time, next time. All right, man. Well, yeah, thank you care. so much. <laughs>